Oh man, it's so good to see everybody tonight. It's good to see the room full on our last of the parables studies tonight. Matthew chapter 22. We're going to, I'm going to try to cover quite a bit of ground with you today on this. Um, And I think what's going to happen tonight, Lord willing, is that um, oh, some things that some some phrases that you've heard. I'm hoping that by the end of the night you'll understand them a little bit better and see where they're plugged into the scriptures. Matthew chapter 22, and uh, we're going to read start starting in verse one. And Jesus answered and spake unto them again by parables and said, The kingdom of heaven, so you notice what he's talking about there. That's this millennial kingdom, the earthly kingdom that he's going to start. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son and sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to the wedding and they would not come. Again, he sent forth other servants saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all the things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it, and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. And the remnant took his servants, and entreated them spitefully, and slew them. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth. And he sent forth his armies, and destroyed those murderers, and burned up their city. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So those servants went out into the highways, and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests." And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither, not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. So, this parable, is, again, it's a very famous parable, the, the marriage supper. And just over and over and over again, things are taught from this parable that are out of context. Um, I read a good statement today. You've heard me say that you know we're supposed to rightly divide the word of truth, and if you don't rightly divide it, you wrongly divide it. But what this man said it was so good, he said, if you don't rightly divide it, you wrongly join it. Isn't that a, a good way to think about it? You, you put things together that aren't supposed to be together. They're supposed to be divided. So we're going to divide some things in this text that are really going to help us. The first thing that we see is the context. The context is the kingdom of heaven. So again, it's not a local church context. So a lot of times when you look at this passage, um, people will preach on this about how we're supposed to invite people to church, that type of thing, and people will refuse That's not what this passage is talking about. Let me just go over it briefly, and then we'll get into some of the detail. So in verse 2, you have the king who makes a marriage for his son. So let's talk about the bride of Christ and try to get an understanding of that. So look with me at uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11. When you get to 2 Corinthians 11, go back to Matthew 22, and I'll show you something. Look at verse 11, Matthew 22 and verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guests, so there there are a group of Baptists that say that only believers that are baptized in Baptist churches that can trace their heritage back to John the Baptist are a part of the Bride of Christ. 
that all the other saved people are the guests. How do you create that from the word guests? That's, that's where that comes from. So, you may have come from a church with that background. The church that, the group that this church was associated with, the Baptist Bible Fellowship, a lot of the guys in the Baptist Bible Fellowship would have believed that. Um, but that's, honestly, it's kind of silly. I don't, I don't believe Pastor Hovestrite believed that, but some of the associations would have. Did P- Pastor Hovestrite never taught that, did no, he? No, he never taught that. Yeah. So, um, I, I just wanted to point that out to you, that that's a, that's a strange teaching from it. So now let's go to the 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Look at verse 2. For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So this is the bride of Christ, and I want you to notice that that virgin is singular. Not virgins, virgin. It's singular. And just like we've studied the work and the works, that that is different. At the judgment seat of Christ, all saved people are judged for their work of what sort it is. At the great white throne judgment, people are judged according to their works. And of course, the wages of sin is death. What you get for what you've done is death. You will, you will receive reward or lose reward based on what sort your work is. The Bible says, be steadfast, um, Always unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. 1 Corinthians 15, 58. The work of the Lord is the work that the Lord was doing when He was here on earth working. That's the work of making disciples. That's what happens at the judgment seat of Christ. Great white throne judgment, you're judged for your works. Here you're seeing that in in verse 2, it says that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. So what he's talking about there is the church is the bride of Christ. Go with me to Revelation chapter 19. Pray for me. I've got so many things about this in my head. and Hopefully I can give them to you in a workable order. So Revelation chapter 19. And so this is when the judgments are over and Jesus Christ is about to return to the earth. And it says this in verse 7, Revelation 19 and verse 7, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to Him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and His wife hath made herself ready. His wife hath made herself ready. What did she have to do to get ready? That's what the judgment seat of Christ is. The wood, hay, and stubble is all burned away. All that's left is gold, silver, and precious stones. Um, the, the people have received their rewards. They're wrapped in their white garments. They have their crowns. Now, some people are appearing naked. And that's one of the things that the Bible warns about. Look at Revelation 16. I think it's 15. Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. Um, So, maybe one of these days I'll do a message on the garments. When you look through the scriptures, it's really quite a study. You might want to do that yourself. But, um, so, now it says at the end of verse 7 that he hath, his his wife hath, hath made herself ready. And to her was granted, we're we're back in Revelation 19, verse 8, and to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. And he saith unto me, Write, Blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he saith unto me, These are the true sayings of God. So who is called to the marriage supper of the Lamb? Not the bride. How many of you think the bride already knew about the marriage? Right? The marriage supper takes place after the marriage, and that's what these guests are invited to. And I want you to see something. Look with me at um, chapter 21. Look at verse 9.
And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven plagues, and talked with me, saying, Come hither, and I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. Now, it's interesting. We're no longer espoused. Now we're married. The marriage has taken place. So I want you to see something else that's interesting. He's going to show the wife. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And so this has caused some confusion for people. This is not the earthly Jerusalem. This is a new heavenly Jerusalem that comes down, and this is for the believers. This is not for Israel. This is for saved people, Jew and Gentile alike. This is for the bride. And we know that, look at what it says in verse 11, having the glory of God and her light was like unto a stone most precious. And it goes on and gives all of these different characteristics, what the building looks like. Um, I've heard this said, people want to accumulate gold in heaven, they use that for asphalt. Jasper is drywall. <laughs> you know, it's interesting. Um, so then look at verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city had no need of the sun, neither of moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Now look at what this says. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it. And the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. So remember what we said about the nations, the nations, the nations. This is the Gentiles. This is us. And so that's, that's the bride of Christ is in this city. And just so that you can see the way that the Bible deals with a, a woman and a city, it's very interesting. Remember, the city of God is Jerusalem and the city of Satan is uh, Babylon. Look at Revelation chapter 17. Look at verse 5. And upon her forehead was a name written, Mystery Babylon the Great, the mother of harlots, and abominations of the earth. Look at verse 18 now. And the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth. Isn't that interesting? So a bride, a woman, and a city. You see that for the bride of Christ, and then you see this for the bride of Satan. It's very interesting, those, those correlations. Um... So that's the bride of Christ is the church, all right? So um, we know Ephesians chapter 5, the husband is the head of the wife, as Christ is the head of the church, and that whole relationship that's identified. So now go back to Matthew chapter 22. Um you know what, before we go to Matthew, it's fine to have Matthew 22 because that's where we're going to be focusing, of course. But go to John chapter 3 and verse 29. John chapter 3, verse 29. So this is John the Baptist that's speaking here. And it says, He that hath the bride is the bridegroom. But the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. This my joy therefore is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. So John is not the bride, and he's not the bridegroom. He's the friend. He is the friend of the bridegroom. So it's an interesting thing here that John the Baptist is the last of the Old Testament prophets, and he is, he's a Jew. And so he is not um, a part of the church. John the Baptist was not a part of the church. So he's not a, a bridegroom, who is Jesus, 
and neither is he the bride. It's an important distinction that you see. Sometimes we wonder, but what about Israel? Where does Israel fit into this? I'm glad you asked. Look at Hosea chapter 2. Now, you remember the story of Hosea and Gomer. Not Gomer Pyle. Shazam! It's not, it's not that. Um... All right, verse 14, Hosea chapter 2 and verse 14. So the story of Hosea and Gomer is God told Hosea to take a wife of whoredom, so marry a harlot. And so then she's rejected and they come back together. That's, that's a biblical picture of the relationship of God and Israel. So look at what God says here, Hosea chapter 2 and verse 14. Therefore, behold, I will allure her, and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. And I will give her uh, her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope. And she shall sing there as in the days of her youth and as in the day when she came up out of the land of Egypt. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishi and shalt call me no more uh, Baali. Now, so that is Ishi, that's husband, and Baali is Lord. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth. So, you know, that's obviously the adultery. And they shall no more be remembered by their name. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, and with the fowls of heaven, and with the creeping things of the ground. So now, now remember what has happened in the tribulation. Keep your place here. Go to Revelation. Chapter 6. Look at verse 8. And I looked and behold... So Revelation 6, verse 8. And I looked and behold a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was death, and hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beasts of the earth. So as a part of the tribulation, even the animals are turning against the people and killing them. Okay, so go back to Hosea. Verse 18, And in that day will I make a covenant for them. And of course, that day, doesn't that help us to understand when this is? the day that the Lord establishes His millennial day. Remember, a thousand years is a day. A day is a thousand years. This is the millennium. And in that day will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow and the sword and the battle out of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. Now look at this. And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness and in judgment and in loving kindness and in mercies. I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness and thou shalt know the Lord. And it shall come to pass in that day I will hear, saith the Lord. I will hear the heavens and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil and they shall hear Jezreel. And I will sow her unto me in the earth, and I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them that were not a people, or which were not a people, Thou art my people, and they shall say, Thou art my God. Just like in Zechariah chapter 13. It's the same thing. But what's going on here is God's healing the earth, and He's marrying His bride, Israel. So the bride of the Father is Israel. The bride of the Son is the church. All right, the bride of Christ is the church, the Lamb's bride. Um, let's see. Go with me to. Let me get my cross reference here. Isaiah 62.
All right, look at verse 4. Thou shalt no more be, for, be termed forsaken, neither shall thy land any more be termed desolate, but thou shalt be called Hephzibah, and thy land Beulah. For the Lord delighteth in thee, and thy land shall be married. For as a young man marrieth a virgin, so shall thy sons marry thee. And as the bridegroom rejoiceth over the bride, so shall thy God rejoice over thee. So, you have this, this picture in the Bible of Israel being the bride of God and the church being the bride of Christ. So, that's an important distinction that I want you to know. So, go back to Matthew chapter 22. And look at verse 2. The kingdom of heaven is like unto a certain king which made a marriage for his son. Who do you think that king is? Right? The father, God. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden. Remember last week we looked at who the servants are. The servants are the prophets. All right? So the prophets were until John. So they called the people. Then he sent his apostles out to call the people. And you'll see that in the text. And sent forth his servants to call them that were bidden to a wedding, and they would not come. So that's the prophets. That's the Old Testament prophets. Again, he sent forth other servants, saying, Tell them which are bidden, Behold, I have prepared my dinner, my oxen and my fatlings are killed, and all things are ready. Come unto the marriage. But they made light of it and went their ways, one to his farm, another to his merchandise. They still rejected the prophets. Verse 6, And the remnant took his servants and entreated them spitefully and slew them. So this is the apostles. So you see the different groups that he's talking to. The, the, the prophets come, and then more prophets come. And then he sends the apostles, and they slay the apostles. They kill the apostles. Then look at verse 7. But when the king heard thereof, he was wroth, and he sent forth his armies and destroyed those murderers and burned up their city. That took place in AD 70. God sent them and destroyed Israel, destroyed Jerusalem. Now remember, look at, look at chapter 21 and verse 41. They say unto him, He will miserably destroy those wicked men and will let out his vineyard unto other husbandmen which shall render him the fruits in their seasons. So that's the same thing. Jesus is telling the same story. He, he, he came to you. He came to you. But now he's talking about this um, marriage of his son, and he's inviting guests to come to the supper. So now I want you to see what happens in verse 8. Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Now what a lot of commentators do, even those who, who have been good up to this point, since he destroyed the city after AD 70. Now he must be talking about the church. And so now we're preaching the gospel and inviting people as guests to the wedding. Well, who would those guests be? If you're saved, you're the bride. You're not a guest. You're the bride. So the mistake that people make is they jump from the a kingdom reference to a church age reference, but what we have to remember is the church hasn't been revealed yet. It's not there. So, of course, keep your place in Matthew 22. Go to Ephesians chapter 3. Look at verse 1. For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles. Isn't that interesting? Is there anything significant there, do you think? He says, If you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, word, how that by revelation He made known unto me... What are those next two words? Mystery. The mystery. What mystery is He talking about? He'll tell us. As I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read, when ye read, ye may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. So now, not only is it a mystery, but it's a mystery of Christ. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men. Now, let me ask you a question. Are all the people that came before him sons of men? Right? You have the sons of God. Those are angelic beings. These sons of men, 
that they didn't get this information before it came to Paul. Verse 5, which in other ages was not made known unto the sons of men as it is now revealed unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same, what's that next word? Body and partakers of his promise in Christ by the gospel. So this this mystery that had not been revealed as this mystery of the body of Christ, that every saved person is in the body of Christ, that, it, that just had not been revealed. So that is not what Matthew chapter 22 is talking about. So what is Matthew chapter 22 talking about? Let's go back there. When you get to verse 8, Then saith he to his servants, The wedding is ready, but they which were bidden were not worthy. Go ye therefore into the highways, and as many as ye shall find, bid to the marriage. So the servants went out into the highways and gathered together all as many as they found, both bad and good, and the wedding was furnished with guests. Okay, So what's happening here is, you have the marriage has taken place. Where has the marriage taken place? Where can we find out that information? Look with me at Luke chapter 12. Yeah, yeah, it's Luke chapter 12 and verse 36. Um, verse 34, For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. And ye yourselves, like unto men that wait for their Lord, when he will return, look at this, when he will return from the wedding. So the Lord is returning from the wedding. Am I making that up or is that just what it says? All right. So this is, this is an interesting thing. So it says that when he cometh and knocketh, they may open unto him immediately. Blessed are those servants whom the Lord, when he cometh, shall find watching. Verily I say unto you, that he shall gird himself, and make them to sit down to meet, and will come forth and serve them. And if he shall come in the second watch, or come in the third watch, and find them so, blessed are those servants. And this know, that if the goodman of the house had known what hour the thief would come, he would have watched and not have suffered his house to be broken through. Be therefore ready also, for the Son of Man cometh at an hour when ye think not. So what this is talking about is at the end of the tribulation period. So remember, during the tribulation, you have the judgment seat of Christ. Israel's being dealt with on the earth. In heaven, you have the judgment seat of Christ. At the end of the judgment seat of Christ, you have the marriage of the Lamb. After the marriage of the Lamb, the king returns to the earth and they invite the guests to the supper. So all of these guests are the people that have come through the tribulation. All right? They, they've endured to the end and now they're invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. They're not the bride of Christ. They're not in Christ. It's very important that we get that. They're not the bride of Christ. The church is the bride of Christ. Remember, after chapter 3 of the book of Revelation, the church isn't mentioned until you get to chapters 21 and 22. So, all of that dealing with the earth, it's drawing men to God, Jesus Christ drawing Israel back to himself, judging the world, and not only the world, but all of those nations that uh, come in, those sheep and goat nations. So, it's an important thing to see that. Um, so, one of the things that I want you to see about our text back in Matthew chapter 22, and I should have mentioned this early on, one of the best things to help you interpret this is that the guests aren't getting married. Anybody ever been to a wedding that wasn't yours? Did you get married that day? No, you're the guest. It is not your marriage. Doesn't that help you understand a little bit more what's going on in this? See, that's where some of the confusion comes in. And when people make this the church, here's where the problem comes in. 
Look at verse 11. And when the king came in to see the guests, he saw there a man which had not on a wedding garment. And he saith unto him, Friend, how camest thou in hither not having a wedding garment? And he was speechless. Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth, for many are called, but few are chosen. See, you thought you were saved, but you didn't have works meet for repentance. So you're not really saved. So you're out. Man, there's all kinds of horrible preaching that comes from this. What kind of works do you have to have to get saved? None. None. What kind of clothing do you have to have to get saved? None. When you get saved, Christ clothes you. Okay? So now we have a problem. Who in the world is this talking about? Who is it? I think you're going to find this really interesting. It's Satan. It's Satan. Um, let me show you. Pretty interesting. Um, let's see. Look at... Oh, I wish I, I didn't write the cross-reference down. So when, when, you can look it up, when Judas came to Jesus in the garden, what did Jesus call him? Friend. Isn't that interesting? And look at what he says here in verse 12. And he saith unto him, Friend... How camest thou in hither? It's an interesting thing. So let's try and track this down. So look at John chapter 6 and verse 70. John 6 and verse 70. Jesus answered them, Have not I chosen you twelve, and one of you is a devil? He spake of Judas Iscariot, the son of Simon, for he it was that should betray him, being one of the twelve. And you know what happens? Is Satan actually enters in him bodily. That's such a creepy thing. Can you imagine that? So, the Bible, look with me at um, Acts chapter 1. It's interesting what the Bible says about him. Verse 16, look at verse 15. And in those days, so Acts 1, verse 15, And in those days, Peter stood up in the midst of the disciples and said the number of the names together were about 120. Men and brethren, this scripture must needs have been fulfilled, which the Holy Ghost by the mouth of David spake before concerning Judas, which was guide to them, that took Jesus. For he was numbered with us and had obtained part of this ministry. Can you imagine Peter talking to these people? And he's saying, you guys know him. He was one of us and he led them to Jesus. All right. Now look at verse 25. So this is when they're praying about who would take Judas's place. That he may take part of this ministry and apostleship from which Judas by transgression fell that he might go to his own place. His own place. What is his own place? Look at Revelation chapter 9. So it's interesting that Judas is intermingled now with who Satan is. Uh, that's what I want you to see here. Um, so, Revelation chapter 9, look at verse 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. Now, how many of you have already noticed a repetition between the last passage and this passage? What, what is it so far? 
in those days. So whenever you see that phrase, in those days, look for a reference to the tribulation. So you might have thought when the apostles were talking after the death of Christ, after his resurrection, what's the in those days? It's just to cause you to find that cross-reference to Judas and to Satan right here. So look, look where we are again, verse 6, Revelation 9, 6. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle. And on their heads were, as it were, crowns like gold, and their faces were, like the, were as the faces of men. Can you imagine what that's going to be like? And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. And they had breastplates, as it were, breastplates of iron. And the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and their power was to hurt men five months. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue his name is Apollyon. So this is, this is Satan. This is Antichrist. This is that, that son of perdition. And the thing that's important for you to see here is that name Abaddon. You see that there? In the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon. That is perdition. That's what that is. So this is speaking of Satan and Judas is called that son of perdition. Look at John chapter 17. <clears throat> Verse 12. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in thy name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. So if you want to be technical, Abaddon is perdition, that's Satan. Judas is the son of Satan. Alright, so you're seeing this connection. This is the title of Antichrist. So look at Second Thessalonians chapter 2. Isn't it wild how far you go from a parable? You know, you start there and you start searching through the Scriptures. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Verse 1. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or be troubled, neither by spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, as from us, as that the day of Christ is at hand. So what, what Paul knew was there were going to be these false gospels going around. And I just ordered a book that is a bunch of these false gospels to compare them. Um, verse 3, let no, man's de let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come, except there come a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed... Now look at what he's called. The son of perdition. The same name as Judas. You know, there are people who believe that Antichrist will actually be a reincarnation of Judas himself. I don't necessarily believe that. It's Satan, you know, in, in embodying someone, and dwelling someone. But isn't that interesting that that's what he's called here? Um, so... He'll go into perdition because he is the son of perdition. So I want to compare. So go to back to Matthew 22. Get Matthew 22 and Revelation 20. Matthew 22, 13. And then we'll go to Revelation 20. Matthew 22, 13 says, Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. You know what I wonder? I wonder if God lets the, uh, the prophets, those Old Testament prophets, do this. This says the servants. 
Maybe he lets the apostles do it, those other servants, later. That, that's interesting, isn't it? Now, I know he uses angels to do it, and the Bible calls the angels ministering spirits. But, but look again what it says. Then shall the king, said the king to his servants, bind him hand and foot and take him away and cast him into outer darkness. So remember what time frame we're doing here. What time is it? So the marriage has taken place in heaven. They come back and people are gathering these, these guests to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And Satan himself shows up at this feast. And the king says, bind him. Bind him. All right. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Verse 1. And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. You see that? He was bound hand and foot in chapter 20, in, in Matthew 22. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal upon him that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years should be fulfilled, and after that he must be loosed a little season. So remember what happens at the end of... Um, we saw it in Hosea, where he, God makes a covenant with the animals, and he takes war and battle from the world, right? When he establishes his kingdom. So he takes that war away when he establishes his kingdom, and at the end of the kingdom... At the verse 7, so in Revelation 20 and verse 7, And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison and shall go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and compassed the camp of the saints about and the beloved city, and fire came down from God out of heaven and he devoured them. So there's no, they don't have weapons. These people, they don't need weapons. They don't need any of that because God himself destroys Satan at the end of the kingdom, at the end of the millennium when he's released. But when you go back to Matthew chapter 22, this is Satan showing up at this marriage supper of the Lamb which is taking place on the earth after the tribulation, at the beginning of the kingdom, and he is bound together. So what is the teaching of this parable that God sent the prophets to invite the Jews. God sent more prophets to invite the Jews. Then God sent the apostles to invite the Jews. God even sent the apostles to invite the Jews after the resurrection up to Acts chapter 7. Kept inviting, inviting, inviting. It was all ready for them. They rejected it. What happened? God started working with the church, which is not foreseen in the Old Testament. That was hidden until the Bible tells us in Ephesians chapter 3 that God revealed it to His apostles. So in that, this interim time that we live, well, blindness in part has happened unto Jews until the fullness of the Gen unto Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. What's going to happen next is the rapture of the church. Oh, this is so good. Let me, let me just say this. The guests are never raptured to heaven. The church is raptured to heaven. The guests are gathered on the earth. So we can't confuse the church with these guests. It's different. So we're raptured to heaven. In those seven years, we have the judgment seat of Christ and then the marriage of the Lamb with His bride. We're a spouse now. We're married after we've made ourselves ready, Revelation 9, 7, or 19, 7. And then we're the, the Lamb's wife, 21, 9, Revelation 21, 9. And then, according to Luke chapter 12, the king comes back to the earth from the wedding and gathers the guests, and those servants are expected to be ready. That's the same teaching as the parable of the ten virgins. Remember we looked at that early on in our study. We are a chaste virgin. A chaste virgin. The ten virgins are those who 
are evangelized with the gospel, the everlasting gospel, during the tribulation period by the 144,000 virgins. Those are who are gathering these guests. They're gathering these guests. And they come in. Some of them are good. Some of them are bad. And those who make it through the kingdom, those are the ones, the bad ones, end up following Satan at the end of the millennium. Such an interesting thing, the way all of this ties together. So that's the teaching of the parable.